Who invented racism? It wasn't black people. So why should we be the ones to solve it? Racism in football is about more than just high profile instances of abuse that grab the headlines. Racial bias, a lack of diversity in leadership roles, and the effects of structural racism all serve to create an unequal playing field when it comes to sport. In 2020, the Danish research body Run Repeat conducted a study into racial bias in football commentary. They analysed over 2,000 statements from commentators over 80 games across Serie A, La Liga, Liga and the Premier League. What they found was evidence that black and mixed race players are more often described in terms of their physical and athletic abilities, while white players are more likely to be praised for their technique, leadership skills and intelligence, a phenomenon that can also be found in German football. Supposed differences in ball skills between players of different skin colour are explained by their genetic constitution. If African footballers do not fit the category of a playful, trick-loving player, media reports often stress other alleged African attributes. I would say the report basically kind of confirmed what I already knew but maybe didn't articulate to myself. In the context of football, yeah, black people have always noticed that uh, we're reduced to our physical capacities, whereas white people will be lauded for their vision and intelligence and their hard work. So it's definitely something I've noticed and I've written about and it's definitely entrenched. It is really the subtle comments and it's something that, you know, you hear all the way up the game, grassroots, or all the way up to the top. That's something we've been talking about for within the team for many, many years. Like a lot of us players relate to it as well. I can only talk from my perspective, and if someone said when I was coming through you had pace and power, I wouldn't take offence to that, do you know what I mean? Because that was majority of my game. But when it was a Yaya Torre who was a genius upstairs and pace and power, and they only talk about his pace and the power, that's when it becomes a, a problem to me. Where it stems from, it's a hangover from, uh, I suppose, the European perspective of Africans, which is very hard to undo. So I think it's a great first step, but I think it should be kind of the first point into kind of a longer piece. You know, this needs to be expanded to include more leagues, to include more games, to include women's football. I also think it needs to be applied to the written football media as well. According to a 2017 report by the National Council for the Training of Journalists, just 1% of UK journalists are black. There's never been a black sports editor at a mainstream newspaper. There isn't a single black sports columnist who isn't a former footballer. And while the UK's main broadcasters have taken steps to ensure more egalitarian panels, until recently switching on the television or opening the paper would immediately highlight a worrying disparity. The lack of black faces and representation of people that look like me in media wasn't really apparent to me. When you're quite young, you're just taking it all in. It's like, it's football, so I didn't notice. But it's only when you get older and you start thinking about what you want to do. And that's when it really struck me that it looks as if this is a closed shop and that there's no way for me to get in. I don't remember sort of engaging or seeing anyone else who I thought, oh, like, they could have had an upbringing like mine or, like, they'll be writing about things that relate to my identity or my experiences of, of race. When you're looking at the commentary side, the journalism side of things, there's not many black people involved. And I just felt like that didn't really represent me or any of the other women who were into football that I knew. So I think what that does is it asphyxiates aspiration in younger black people. There was a time that I thought I might wanted to be like a sports journalist. I did my NCTJ and I did a sports module and I went to talk sport and intern there and I was like, oh, maybe I can do this. And I got to write about Chelsea all day and I loved it. But then I was like, I just looked around and I was like, gosh, this is a really overwhelmingly white male space. Um, and it was one of the factors that actually just put me off. But on the flip side, I guess spurred me on to create my own space. Um, not unfamiliar with being the odd one out in the room. So, I, I, you know, it hasn't stopped me getting to this point and I'd, I'd like to think it wouldn't stop me going forward, but, you know, it does take a bit of a mental toll, a bit of an emotional toll as well, just sort of having to carry your whole community in your shoulders, because that's what you do. When you step into a room now of, you know, maybe a group of white women or white men or people that, you know, don't really, maybe not, maybe don't understand your, your background or your culture and that kind of thing, you are everything, you are everyone. And that is, so over, overwhelming at times. The issue is stark enough in the UK, 
but for black people in Germany, it feels even more pronounced. I'm laughing actually. I, I, I'm just laughing because you said you don't have black people. I, I, I just want to say we don't have black people as you have. Like even if you do the talks, you know what I mean? Like like the Sky talks, you still have some former players. Right now you, you sign Chunks and Philly to Sky. Like you have black people commenting, black people being an um, important voice to the outside. Yeah, in Germany, to be fair, at least as I recall, um, I haven't seen any black um, analysts or, or anything like that. Um, and I do think it's important. You see Mika Richards and Pachis Everest slowly coming in. And when you do listen to them, you do see as well, you see the difference. You hear the, you hear the, certain, the way they talk about certain players. It's almost like me talking about a player, if that makes sense. It's certainly true that there's been an improvement in on-screen opportunities for black presenters and pundits in the UK, and the positive impact of more diversity in prestigious roles shouldn't be underestimated. There are some fans who are just like virulently racist. There's another star of fan who might not have any black friends, might not feel hostile towards black people, but might not see a black person as being able to be their mate. And then they'll see someone like Micah Richards, um, Sky now, and um, they might be like, you know what, Micah's actually like me in a cultural sense. And I think, yeah, that will definitely help attitudes as well. It was a, a sort of penny drop moment when one of the young black players came up to me and, and said how proud they were of being involved in our tournament and that it was run by a black woman. My main inspiration was Moose Rokonga, who's a writer and a broadcaster, and I saw him do a poem for the FA. I kind of looked at this guy and I was like, he looks like me in a way. He's doing his own thing. He's interpreted football culture in his own way. He's remade it in his image. So I think after seeing him do that, a seed kind of germinated in my mind at that age. That's important that we understand that you are allowed in those spaces. And um, that's what we're trying to make sure the young people understand too. The acknowledging these gains is important. Greater diversity in front of camera only goes so far. In front of the camera, I think they're going to continue to bring black people into that space. I think obviously where we need to see more changes behind the camera. Most of the times when I went to work with bigger company, they, they were like, okay, you're the first black guy. Everything we do or like every time we have like people of color working somewhere, um, it's just like a test. I mean, it's good to see the change taking place like regardless, but what, what it means is that they don't necessarily have the foundations there to support people who are coming through. It's not just about, you know, increasing the quota of black employees that you have. You know, some of the things that we've called for at BCOMS is to make sure that white executives have certain level of training before they're even given the jobs. We want to make sure that, that your black employees are being looked after. How do we get to that space where you feel like you're in a position where you can just go for it and not have to think or worry about what people who don't look like you are thinking? And I think that that's the space that BCOMs are really trying to push towards for, you know, their black professionals in this. It seems clear that the lack of diversity in sports media, as well as the absence of structures that allow for true equality and inclusion, all contribute to inadequate coverage of a game where black people make up a huge percentage of on-pitch talent. How does it make any sense that you look at the, 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 the English football team um, as it is today, you look at the athletics team and you look and see how many black and brown faces there are, but everyone that's writing about them and talking about them don't look like them. The more you cover those players, if you're not bringing a nuanced and sensitive perspective, um, you're just going to lose. Sometimes when you sit in front of a, a journalist, like, you're just on the, the defence because you, you think that like, they're looking for an angle. It's, it's difficult for someone to write about a person when they, when they don't know where they're coming from and what they've had to go through. As well as affecting the overall quality of reporting, there are other, more pernicious consequences of the lack of diversity in key positions. You don't think about that stuff until you necessarily, until maybe you get a write-up or until you get um, the attention that isn't necessarily that positive. And then you start to think about, okay, why are they talking about me like this, but talking about such and such like that? And I think that that's when you start to think, oh, okay, this is a bit weird. Me and James Milner, we was uh, both buying Ferraris. It was 23, just won the Premier League. We ordered them. I parked here and he parked me behind me. And then in the paper, it's young, flashy Richards. And then James Milner, exact same car, all of them together. Not a word said 
about James Milner. I, I know what I was doing. I'm not stupid. Look at the, the, the change in tone sometimes of the way they report on um, Anthony Joshua, on the, the way they report on Lewis Hamilton. And it's not, it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an undertone. How we, how we eradicate that and get rid of that is by, of course, diversifying the newsroom, having more editors in positions of power that read things like that and say, guys, OK, I'm going to need more reasoning as to why you've gone in at this angle. I think it's extremely important because when you have the opportunity to involve um, different different genders, different uh, races, you're always going to have um, different perspectives, and I think that that's super important. Um, you know, when you're viewing sports, when you're viewing, um, you know, anything that's involving people. It's the more variance you bring to the newsroom, the more people will naturally learn. So it won't necessarily have to be unconscious bias training. It can just be your colleagues black, right, or your colleagues mixed race, and then that will allow your attitudes to evolve, mature. Broadcasters like Sky and the BBC now hold training sessions with their presenters, reporters and commentators, recognising the importance of the language used to describe athletes from different backgrounds. But clearly there's still a long way to go. And there's a generation of collectives who aren't waiting around for that change to happen. Unless some people create space, you won't see a change in the media industry. Formed in response to the current shape of football media, each of these collectives are remaking the culture in their image. Rather than waiting for a seat at the table, they've built their own. Romance FC is a creative football collective. We forge opportunities and paid work for women and non-binary individuals. It was founded out of the need of small social spaces for women that were outside of clubs and pubs. Caracol magazine allows black fans to see their stories and experiences mapped onto the game in a sensitive, an accurate way. I established Season Zine in 2016 to counter the fact that modern football culture is male, pale and stale. My coach, he was a former football player, professional football player, and he was like, OK, we have a lot of African players who aren't playing in the club. And we just took that energy and formed the first um, African club in Berlin. I started it because I've always read sports writing, football writing in particular, and I realised that there was an absence of black writers. And as a byproduct, I realized that when these writers spoke about black players or players who had African heritage, they couldn't really get to a part of them that I knew was there. I think there was a perspective that was being missed. I'm a big believer of being the change you want to see. I also just felt like, more generally, um, that there needed to be a space where women, non-men, non-white people could have a space and talk about football and be creative and be experimental and basically just rip up the rules of what's, what was happening already in media. It was a safe space, like we had people like, like um, who weren't in the club just coming every Sunday and supporting us. It was very important for us to show that we're capable of doing our own project. I've got kind of like this mindset of if it's not me, who else? Obviously now I've gotten to a point where I'm now providing that sort of kind of space and platform for other girls just like me and it's sort of like, now it's not just about myself, it's, it's a bigger picture. Underpinning this surge in black-owned and run platforms and spaces is a shared belief in the importance of the collective. In everything I do, I try and include marginalised voices that aren't being heard elsewhere and just give them that space where they can be honest and kind of provide angles and stories that you probably wouldn't hear anywhere else. It's great to know that what you're doing is, is more than just giving some girls somewhere to play football, which equally is important, but you know, we're changing their lives in a sense, changing their attitudes, changing the way that they see things, the way that they behave towards things and the way they behave towards other people. The most satisfying aspect of creating Caracom has just been the community of people that I, I've gotten to meet, um, how much I've learned from them. A foundational aspect of what Gaudam does is, is support our community or, or various communities that we work with. But even though we're separate in that sense, the community in an online sense and obviously when I put on events is very real. We didn't get into this to sort of get popularity or for it to blow up. It really was to sort of just widen the community and get people working closer together and especially women working closer together and not sort of be always seen as competitors like you know we're here to help each other out. It's almost something you can't imagine kind of thing so when we did start it it was like oh yeah let's pick up a camera or something we, we didn't expect at all. The fact that it's like my friends and family is like it's almost you're free to do whatever you want. To do it with your friends, there's nothing better. In conjunction with a growing number of young professional players who are challenging the narrative used to appraise them, this new generation is breeding confidence that meaningful change is possible. Things are definitely speeding up. People are putting their foot down and people are speaking out and actively 
identifying the issues that we have and saying, you know, there isn't enough black people in this. I'm confident of that not in the immediate future, but eventually it will. You'll, you'll see a, a huge change. Like I feel like we're a very straightforward sort of generation. I feel like we do really want to get things done. The change is there to be made and the change makers are ready to make it.